gather now. Jesus only is our message. Jesus all our theme shall be. We will lift up Jesus ever. Jesus only will we sing. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this workers' retreat. We praise your name because you brought us to fulfill a definite thing in our lives. And we are praying that your intention for calling us together will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that from the very beginning tonight, 
you will speak to our hearts. Amen. Lord, our hearts are open. Our ears are open. We want to hear you speak to our hearts. Lead us on, O Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come to the workers' retreat, we need to understand that God has brought us together so as to fulfill a special need in our lives. As you know, other districts have come for their own workers' retreats. And this one we're having is not exactly the same program that we had with the other districts. We have made the program to suit every district and to suit the people that are together at the workers' retreat for the districts. For the first message, we're looking at the message, looking at the unseen. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, from verse 17 to verse 18, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I'm talking to you tonight on looking at the unseen. You may not realize it, but this is a singular thing that determines whether a person will answer the call of God or not. This is a unique thing that determines whether a person will succeed or will fail in the calling of the Lord. Looking at things which are not seen, refusing to look at things which are seen. As to consider the call of God to a man or to a woman in getting saved, if the man, if the man draws back, and he does not immediately give his life to the Lord Jesus Christ, is looking at something, and is refusing to look at some other things. When God calls a man or a woman to the ministry, and he tells him or her to do something for the glory of his name, for the building of the kingdom, if he accepts, he's looking at some things. If he rejects, he's looking at some things. But here the Bible tells us that as for affliction, there are afflictions that come upon people. And if we look at those afflictions, the things that are for a moment, and the things that ought to work, far more exceeding an eternal weight of glory, if we look at those afflictions, at those weaknesses, at those infirmities, we never can answer the call of God. And Paul the Apostle emphasized, he said, for those people of his own generation who answered the call, who fulfilled the call, who made a success of the ministry that God called them to. There was one thing that stood very clear in their lives. They looked not at the things which are seen, but they kept on looking at things which were not seen. Because the things that are seen, and he talks about them a lot of times in this epistle and in other writings that he did in the epistles, the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. If you are looking at things that your naked eyes can see around you, you are looking at things that are temporal, things that God can change, things that are shakeable, things that do not remain. If you are refusing to look at things that are not seen by naked eyes, things that are spiritual, things that are contained only in the mind of God. If you are not looking at them, you are refusing to look at things which are eternal, things which are unshakable, things which are changeless, and things that will actually make, make you succeed in the work of the Lord. We'll come back to that passage, but let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27. By faith, he forsook Egypt, 
not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. This talks about Moses and in concluding about his ministry or commenting about the success he had in the ministry, the word of God has this to say, that he became successful because he was seen, he was as if he was seeing the invisible. Again, he was looking at things which are not seen. Which tells us again that if we fail in our lives, it means that we have been looking at the things that are seen, at the things that are shakeable, are the things that bring discouragement, are the things which are temporal or physical. The Christian life, as well as the Christian ministry, is a life and a ministry of faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Before a man or a woman can manifest faith, he or she must be looking at things not seen. And he must be able to take the promises of God by faith. And it is that faith that is the evidence of things not seen. If a man will look at things which are seen, at things which are physical, at things that surround him or her, he will not be able to live by faith. He will not be able to walk by faith. Neither will he be able to move with the Lord and do the things of the Lord. Because for you to be successful in the work of the Lord, you must look at things which are not seen. Verse 7, by faith, Noah, being warned of God, of things which are not seen, as yet moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world, because and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. The major difference between Noah and the people around him in his own days is that they were looking at things which are seen, at things which are temporal. But then, when God warned Noah of things not seen as yet, he believed. He moved on. He acted in line with seeing the invisible, hearing the unheard of. And because of that, he was distinguished from his neighbors. In verse 8, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive an inheritance, obeyed and went out, not knowing whither he went. Again, the reason for the success of Abraham is that he saw the invisible. He looked at things which were not seen. He meditated at what? his neighbors, his friends, his relatives could not see. And he must have been telling him, we can't see anything to what you are talking about. We can't see what you are relying upon. We can't see what you are throwing your whole weight upon. That's the very secret of the victory of a child of God, of a person that is going to follow God and be successful in the ministry. It is what they cannot see. It is what looks to them invisible that you are relying upon that actually determines the success that you have. Romans chapter 4, verse 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickness the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. Before we can give name to anything, we have to see it. That's how human life operates. But then we are told that God calls those things which be not as though they were. He gives name to the invisible, to the unseen, to what looks unreal, to human beings. That's the very essence of faith, that a child of God can call something his own, even though that thing is not seen yet. And that thing is not known yet by other people. He is looking at the unseen. I can tell you this, that if you are going to be successful in the call of the Lord for your life, and if you are going to be successful in the ministry that God has given you, you must specialize at seeing the unseen. Looking at the unseen. And you know that is not natural. 
What is natural is to walk by sight. What is natural is to go by what we see. What is natural is to go by what we feel. If we feel some strength, if we think that we have some energy, if we can see that we have the wisdom, if we can see that we have the knowledge, it is not difficult preaching. It is not difficult saying that I will go out, I will do something for the Lord. But all those things that you can see in yourself, the wisdom, the knowledge, the resources, everything that you can see, they are temporal. The things that will actually be useful in the work of the Lord, in the ministry that God has given unto you, there are things you cannot see. There are things that are hidden in the mind of God, in the heart of God, that you can only follow God by faith, if you like, with your eyes closed. Because when you open your eyes, all those things that you can see around you, they will fail you in the ministry. But when you close your eyes, all those things that you cannot see, and you, you say, I don't think I have this, I don't think I have this, I don't think I have that, those things that you cannot see, when you can look at the unseen, those are the things that determine the victory in your life and the success of the ministry. Even though it is natural to walk by sight, yet we know that walking by sight leads to fear, leads to unbelief, leads to failure, leads to disobedience. What made the children of Israel not, be, not to be able to get to the land of Canaan? The things they saw. What helped Caleb and Joshua to be able to get to the land of Canaan? The things they didn't see. While the multitudes were looking at what they could see, the giants they saw, fear came on them. Unbelief rose up within them. It determined their failure. It led them into disobedience. But even though Caleb and Joshua had seen those same giants, those same mountains, those same difficulties, those same uncrossable rivers, they decided they would look at the unseen. And they acted as if they could see the invisible that determined their victory. And you must understand in your own Christian life, as well as your own Christian ministry, whatever you have confidence in, and you say, I can see that, I can hold that, I can touch that, those things cannot give you lasting victory. But those things that you cannot really perceive that you have, you cannot really understand that you possess, if they are promised by the Lord, though they are invisible, though they are unseen, if you look at the unseen, those are the things that will actually make you to be effective. In Matthew chapter 14, from verse 22, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side, while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit, and they cried out for fear. What troubled them? What they saw. They saw Jesus Christ walking on the sea. And from their own carnal understanding, human understanding, natural way of thinking, they felt only a spirit could walk on the water. Now, if you think about it very well, that shouldn't be strange to you. In our own human understanding, human beings don't walk on water, unaided by the power of God, unaided by the Spirit of God. And if you also think about the superstitions you knew before you ever came to the Lord, spirits can do anything. Spirits in superstition can stand on the point of a pin. Spirits can walk on the water. Spirits can float in the air. Now you have known all those things superstitiously. And even though these people were born again, and they had been following the Lord Jesus Christ down deep beneath 
the very surface of the heart, there was this superstition still lurking behind their hearts. And immediately they saw Jesus walking on the water, they were very sure that's the fulfillment of that superstition. That's a spirit. And what they saw and what they believed brought fear in their hearts. And they cried out and they were troubled. Many times when we are troubled, our troubles have no base. Many times the foundation of your trouble is a superstition you knew long, long ago. And that superstition had not been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ in your heart. Sometimes long ago you had had a particular sentence and that sentence had remained in your heart. And at a, time, at a time of difficulty, at a time of trouble, that sentence will come up in your heart and you believe that sentence more than you believe the promises of God. And because of looking at what you can see, you make a conclusion. Fear and unbelief rise up in your hearts. But in verse 27, straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if thou if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. How did he do the impossible? He looked at things that were unseen. He didn't look at things he could see. For a moment, he didn't think you couldn't walk on the water. It's unnatural. It's unreal. It can never be done except in a dream. It can never be done except by a spirit. And you are still a human being. At the moment that he was looking at the unseen and he refused to look at things that he saw, he did the impossible. Whenever you are called to minister, if you could look at the unseen and forget at what you can see, you will do the incredible. You can pray effectively when you do not look at what you can see, but you look at the unseen. You can minister to the needs of the people when you throw yourself in the hands of the Lord and you are willing to make a fool of yourself because you are looking at things which are not seen. You are not looking at things which are seen. Anytime you are looking at the invisible, you are looking at God. You are depending and trusting, standing upon the promises of God. You can do the impossible or the incredible. But then in verse 30, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Failure came when he started looking at things he could see. Success came when he looked at things that he could not see. And so the word of God makes it clear. There are some things we never should look at. If you look at them, you will sink. If you think on them, you will be sinking. If you meditate on them and consider them seriously, you will be sinking. But if you look away from them and you begin to look at things which are not seen, then you will discover that there will be success and victory in your life. Let me show you a few of the things that a believer must never look at. I don't say they don't exist. They are there. But you never look at them. You see, Peter began to sink because he looked at the wind that was boisterous. While he was walking on the water before, the wind was still boisterous. The rage or the waves of the sea was still raging, but he never looked at them. And therefore, he was able to walk on the water. The moment he began to look at those things, they're always there, always there, but the moment you begin to look at them, considering them, meditating on them, you'll begin to have a sinking feeling within you. You'll be sagging. You'll be depressed. You'll be discouraged. And in your discouragement, if you don't remove your eyes from those things that you are looking at, you'll keep on sinking. Before you know, you are at the bottom of the sea. The sea has covered you and covered your ministry. And the waves have covered you and covered your usefulness and will totally cover you out of sight. But it is when you make up your mind, those things are not for me to look at. They are there, but I'm not looking at them. While we look at things which are not seen, but at things which are not seen. 
Why we look not at things which are seen, but we look at things which are not seen. That's the secret of your victory. Let's look back at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 8. For we would not, brethren, have you to be ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, in so much that we despaired even of life. Could you ever imagine that Paul the Apostle had so much trouble, had so much difficulty, that he said the pressure was too much, and that we were pressed out of measure, that our strength couldn't take the pressure anymore. Have people ever pressurized you? They put so much pressure upon you. It may be in the family. It may be in your place of work. It may be in your neighborhood. It may even be among believers that there is so much pressure that you can say like Paul the Apostle, we were pressed out of measure. We were troubled. That in so much we despaired even of life. And if you look at those things, you will not be able to continue in the ministry. How could Paul the Apostle remain an apostle, remain in the work of God, remain in the ministry with so much pressure, with so much trouble, that he even said they were about despairing of life because he made up his mind, those things were there, we we'll never look at them. Because there are things which will be changed by the hand of God. Today they are there. Tomorrow, when we allow God to make a change, they are no more there. There are things that are shakeable. They do not have a foundation. Because the pillar under them, the foundation under them, are not eternal. They are temporal. Therefore, we don't look at them. As the foundation or the pillars under them are temporal, so are those things themselves. The trouble, the pressure, the difficulties, the despair, the discouragement. We never look at them because the wind will soon blow them away like chaff. The wind of the spirit will blow them away, will look for them, will not see them. Therefore, it is better keep on looking at the things which are not seen, that have eternal foundation, unshakable foundation. In chapter 4, verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. If you understand what Paul the Apostle was saying, he said, we are troubled on every side to the point of perplexity. That if we yielded to the perplexity, we could become confused and not know which direction to go because on every side every path seems to be smelling of trouble and yet we are not distressed yet we are not in despair how could they be surrounded with so much trouble so much perplexity and so much confusion and not be in despair and never be distressed think about a man that the jews were after him the gentiles were after him the false brethren were after him. Even the good brethren in Jerusalem, they, were, they also did not understand him. A man like that, that had trouble on every side and was uh, perplexed, not knowing which way to go. And yet, no distress, no despair, no discouragement. That man must have been looking at things which are not seen. You see, when you sit down alone by yourself and you are thinking, and you look at this in your mind's eye, in your view, in your understanding, you look at that difficulty, look at that difficulty, look at that difficulty. Every place you turn, every path you turn, there's a difficulty there. And you look at those things, you'll not be able to pray. The other people that pray, it's not because the troubles are not there, they don't look at them. The other people that are able to preach, it's not that there is no difficulty, but they don't look at them. The others that are able to minister to the needs of the need of the needy, it is not because they don't have some pressing problems themselves, it's because they, they never look at them. And if you keep on looking at that thing, it will be magnified. The more you look at trouble, the more that trouble grows. The more you look at a mountain, the more the mountain will grow. But when you turn your back on it and you look at the mountain mover, 
and you look at Christ, the invisible, and you look at the promises of God, while you keep on looking at things that are not seen, the things that are seen will vanish out of your view. But while you keep on looking at the trouble, at the perplexity, and you keep on looking at those things around you, they will bring distress and despair. Verse 9, persecuted but not forsaken, cast down but not destroyed. There were things around Paul the Apostle that if he had looked at them, he'll be cast down. He'll never rise up. He could never have gone on those missionary journeys if he kept on looking at the things around him, the persecution, the misunderstanding. He would have been cast down. You know, in your own life too, you will not be able to go on walking by faith. You will not be able to go on ministering by faith. You'll not be able to go on ministering to the needs of those around you. If you look at the persecution, you'll be cast down. And you look at the things that surround you. The, the best thing for you to do, the thing that will give you the victory, that will make those circumstances to change, and for the wind to blow on them and to drive them away, is keep on looking at things which are not seen. Keep on, keep your eyes away from the things that are seen. In the family, just act as if those things are not there. The husband is not behaving well, act as if that thing is not there. The wife is not cooperating, act as if that those problems are not there. Don't look at the mountain. If you just look away from the mountain, look beyond the mountain at the invisible. You may say the mountain is so high. That is, it has blocked out the view of the power of God from my side. Well, while you cannot see that power of God, and you do not see where the victory will come from, keep on looking at the unseen. You don't see with your eyes. You may not even understand with your mind. You may not be able to calculate and arrive at a conclusion with your brain. Keep on looking at the things which are not seen. That's the secret of the victory. In verse 10, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Chapter 10 of 2 Corinthians. Chapter 10, verse 7. Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? Paul the Apostle asked the Corinthians, he said, let me know whether you'll be successful or whether you'll be a failure. And your answer to this question will tell whether you'll be successful or you'll be a failure. Tell me, do you look on things after the outward appearance? If they said yes, that will spell their failure. If they said no, then they'll be successful. Because we shouldn't look at things after their outward appearance. Goliath came out. As to his outward appearance... He spelled fear. He spelled defeat for the people of God. And when they listened to his voice, his voice was terrifying. Even Saul, the king of Israel, together with all the warriors of Israel, you know what they did? They looked at things which can be seen. They looked at the man. They looked at his armor bearer. They looked at his history. And they said he had been a warrior from his youth. They all fled away in terror. But then here came a little boy. This little boy was ignorant of the history of the man. It's sometimes very good for you when you are ignorant. You know, sometimes, uh, sometimes it is all right, and we do not say it's a sin. When a man goes to the doctor, or a woman goes to the doctor, and he says, I need a medical checkup. You know what the woman is thinking or what the man is thinking? If I know what is wrong with me, I will know what to pray about. That's our thing. But then, before you went to the doctor, you said, maybe it is this, maybe it is this. But you were able to pray at that time. Eventually, you got to the doctor and he tested you. After testing you, he told you the real problem. And he said, for you to understand, let me bring out the encyclopedia. For you as a layman to understand and he brought it out you saw the drawing you saw the description he said that is the problem are you able to pray now more than you prayed before you said if i know my problem i will know what to pray about 
I will know how to channel my prayer. Now you have known the problem. Now you have seen Goliath. Now you have heard his history. You have now known that this man had been a warrior from his youth. It cancels prayer. We begin to look at things that are seen. But the victory is looking at things that are not seen. And so the young boy came. And he looked at the man, and he looked beyond the man. He said, I come in the name of the Lord. For that boy, the name of the Lord can move any mountain, can remove any Goliath, can destroy any giant. The people that were walking by side, they came to talk to him. They said, you cannot do it. You are a little boy. Look at the man. Don't you see his height? Don't you see the spear? Don't you see the armor bearer? Don't you see the history behind him? He said, but that's your problem. I don't see what you see. I see what you cannot see. And then he gave them testimony. When the lion came, I did not see the lion. I saw the power beyond the lion. And that's how I overcame the lion. And he said, when the bear came, I did not see the power in the bear. I saw the power beyond the bear. So Saul said, that's all right for you. But I'll help you out. You will not, you cannot go to defeat Goliath by depending on power that you cannot see. But look at my armor, put this in upon you. This one, you can see this, walk with this. He put it on, he said, this is too heavy. The things you see will be heavy on your heart. When you, you know, when you are joyful, you are light, you are praying, you are going this way, going, you are light. And then somebody came to you and said, the way you are joyful, you don't know what is happening in your family. Let me tell you some secret. Maybe, don't tell your husband that I told you this, but let me tell you what your husband is doing. And then told you, you know, your husband, you know, I met your husband somewhere with uh, one lady. It's like a weight, your heart sank. All your joy left. Now you have known what you shouldn't have known. You've got information you shouldn't have got. Now from that time you got the information, you are walking by sight. And so it became a weight on David. And he said, take your load. I prefer to be light. While I'm light, I see the invisible. And he went, and you know the problem for Goliath? He walked by sight. He saw the little boy. He did not see the God behind him. He did not see the stone in his hand. He said, am I a dog that he sent this little boy to me? He was walking by sight. That's what killed the man. If when he saw David, if he saw the God of Israel behind David, if Goliath had walked, not by sight, but by faith. And he said, this little boy can do havoc, can destroy me. And therefore, if he saw the invisible and had drawn away, he would have spared his life. He remained, and that is what killed him. But David, he said, I see your sword, but I don't see it. I see your spear, but I don't see it. I come in the name of the Lord. And he ran after him, and he threw one stone, and the man came down. He wasn't walking by sight. Show me a man that will train himself. That any time I hear of trouble, I'll never think about it. That man will succeed. You can't defeat that man. Any time I hear something that is depressing, discouraging in my place of work, in my family, or people are talking about the zone, they are talking about the district, and they say this, did you know this information about the district? Well, I didn't know. What is it? And they tell you, if it is something that will, will make you to be walking by side, you say, ah. Uh -huh. So that is going on in our district. If it is something like that, just blot it off as if you never heard. And just walk by faith. And they say, ah, this thing that I just told you now, doesn't it bother you? No, not at all. Why doesn't it bother you? I look at the invisible. I look at things that are not seen. Your victory lies in this. Looking at things that are not seen. When you keep on looking at things that are seen, you know, this problem, that problem, that one is getting married, that one is not getting married, that one is gossiping, that one is grumbling, that one is complaining. If you go by that, you are defeated before Goliath died. But if you look not at the things which are seen, and you're only looking at the invisible, do you look on things after the outward appearance? Since we became Christians, we have been saved, we have been sanctified, we have been baptized in the Holy Ghost. Have we been trained to look at things which are not seen? 
or after all these years that we have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, are we still looking on things after the outward appearance? And when you see something, it removes your joy. If you are just going now and you are happy as you are happy, then somebody came to as you are going, somebody that should say, good evening sister or good evening brother, and she just snubbed you and walked away. Just looking at that, all your joy is gone. Uh -uh. What have I done? Am I, this person, I'm old enough to be her senior sister. You say, maybe she didn't see me. Sister so-and-so, come. Did you see me? Yes, I saw you. Are you mother of Jesus? So if, we do, if I don't worship you, uh, I, have not, I cannot move freely. No, I'm not talking of worshiping me. Couldn't you say good evening? <laughs> you need good evening. Okay, good evening. And then went away. And then as she was going, you turned back, you were watching her, and she was walking arrogantly. Walking as if, whatever you will do, come and do. I will do whatever I like. So, when somebody doesn't greet you, it pains you, I will do it for you double. That alone, greet me, I don't greet you, brings you sorrow. You are sad. You cannot eat. You are not happy again. Because somebody snubbed you. Somebody did not greet you. How many thousands of people are in the world that doesn't know how to greet people? But because of that, we are sad. Joy is lost. Everything is gone. Now, so and so, uh, here you are in the zone. And we have been moving together. I heard that you wanted to get my I saw it on the paper in the church. Is it good like this? Good like what? So if I want to come and if I want to marry, I shall announce to the whole of uh, the whole of Lagos City. No, am I part of? Am I, are you counting me as Lagos City? I'm your sister now. You didn't tell me you are going to get married. And anyway, you know now that I'm going to get married. Okay, I'm going to get married. You are sad. And when they tell you to come and lead us fellowship, you cannot lead us fellowship because somebody wanted to get married. Why don't we train ourselves? And do not look at things that are seen. When you see all those things, just put your eyes away. Somebody is getting married, didn't tell you, good luck to them. Somebody passed by you, did not greet you, good luck to them. Somebody was traveling, ah, sister, where did you go? I went to London now. Are you the one going to give me visa? I went to London, I went for holidays. And we are here, we are living just there. You couldn't even come and say, uh, I was traveling. No. Why should I come and tell you? I know the way now. I know the road to the airport. I have my visa, I have my passport. And God provided money for me. I didn't need to beg anybody. I went, I just traveled just to have a nice time, whether you like it or not. And I'm back. And you are sad. Because somebody went to London and didn't tell you. Why are you killing yourself? All these things that we see that bother us, wash them off. And just live your life looking at the invisible. Looking at things that are unshakable. Looking at things that Jesus will look at. Looking at the promises of God in your life. Do ye still at all these years in the Christian faith? Can't I train myself? Can't you train yourself that we look not at things which are seen, but we look at things which are not seen? Do ye look on things after the outward appearance? Look at verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves, and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. You know sometimes, you are going on the way, and uh, you've just uh, bought uh, a motorcycle and you are very happy oh god i thank you that you provided this motorcycle for me and uh, you were coming to the church and while you were coming you somebody you've been seeing in the district before but you know this fellow you didn't even know that the fellow went to school because you've been seeing one another and uh, while you were riding a motorcycle very very happy this fellow was coming with um, volvo and then he passed you. And then uh, while you are trying to make your way and park, he just, you know, went there and he parked and shut the door and he put his hands in the pocket and said, um, you wanted to park there? Uh, you said, yes, brother. <laughs> well, uh, Volvo needs more space, you know. <laughs> and, um, 
and you felt you see driver or see the or you see the owner and you are watching and eventually you discover is the owner even though you are thanking god before he provided motorcycle for you <laughs> now you cannot thank god anymore so so and so is riding volvo so and so is riding peugeot so and so is riding such and i'm rejoicing and praising god for motorcycle why are you looking at them we dare not be of the number that compare ourselves with the other people. If I drink gari in my house, I look not at things that are seen. You can eat whatever you want to eat in your house. If all I have is bicycle or motorcycle, I look not at things that are seen. You can do whatever you like. Here we come, we want to get married. And we should be happy on the day of our wedding. And on the day of our wedding, somebody was kind enough to lend us a Volkswagen to, you know, to take the couple, the new couple, to where they are going to have their reception. And here we have a lot of people that are wedding, brother and sister so and so, brother and sister so and so. And you discovered while you were, you know, having the rehearsal with the marriage committee, you know, all these people were just ordinary people and they were saying dress this way, don't dress this way, do this and don't do this. On the day of the marriage now, while you are coming and you are coming out of the Volkswagen and here, you know, these people uh, coming out of the Mercedes Benz and you are going to do the marriage together. It was the corner of your eyes, you look at them. You say, the people we did rehearsal together yesterday, and your mind is not in what you are going for again. You start looking at, is it their own, or did they lend them? Why are you looking at that? Why are you bothering yourself? Why are you going to kill yourself because of somebody has Volvo? Whether they lended them or they bought it, what's your business there? We dare not be of the number that compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. You see what stops us in working for God, comparing ourselves. I see what that one is doing. I see what that one is wearing. I see what that one is riding. But we do not compare ourselves or measure ourselves with other people. We just yield ourselves to the Lord. Sometimes we have peculiar problems that we dare not look at. Do you know, brothers and sisters, as we're in the church, we're different you'll find that a particular brother has a physical infirmity or if a sister has a physical infirmity and um, the sister or the brother will spend all her life because of that maybe she limps a little or he limps a little and every time she's very conscious of that that i limp but what does that matter or it may be that the physical infirmity is something that is known to other people. When they see that individual, they see the physical infirmity. And every time when the brother or the sister wants to work for the Lord, when he wants to preach the gospel, anything he wants to do, what he'll be thinking about is that they'll be looking at me that I limp. They'll be looking at me that I have this physical infirmity. Why are we looking at things that are seen? These things that are seen will vanish away. All these things will not stand because they are shakeable and they are changeable and God is able to change them. Well, if you are limping, go to the house fellowship and teach. It is not your limp that is teaching. It is your spirit that is teaching. If you have any physical infirmity, go ahead and teach. It is not the physical infirmity that is teaching the people. It is your heart, your love for God, your spirit that is passing the message across to the people. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in mine infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I will glory in my infirmities. You know, sometimes um, after you are married, you discover that maybe your wife has a particular physical blemish. And the physical blemish may be known to people. It may be something that is open, something very clear. And if you are not careful, you will not be able to love your wife as Christ loved the church. You will be ashamed of her publicly. You cannot go with her publicly because you are looking at things that are seen. You are not looking at things that are not seen. And that destroys your love for your wife. Or it may be your husband. 
you know there are times that you are a believer a christian man and your wife is not yet a christian woman and your wife says um, i like to go to church uh, with you i like the preaching of deeper life the cases who have been playing in the house i really i think i love them but only one condition i don't want to be a hypocrite i want to be who i am whether i'm in your church or i'm at home here and since uh, i'm not religious like you are religious born again born again that you are talking about i'm not in that yet but i like to go to the church i like the way that a pastor your pastor preaches even for that alone i will go there and then she comes with the painting with the jewelry and everything and uh, while you were coming down from the vehicle uh, one of the brothers saw you and said um, Oh, brother, how are you? And started talking to you. And uh, the sister, uh, the, your wife, instead of going, you know, waited so as to wait for you. And the brother, uh, knowing that the person waited, wanting to greet the fellow, uh, asked and said, Brother, is that your wife? He said, uh, Yes. <laughs> and so the brother greeted the wife and all that. But you are ashamed. You are disorganized. You can't pray. You went into the meeting. You can't hear such the scripture. You can't hear the message. That woman has disgraced me. So that man will be looking at me now. So my wife is like that. What's his business? If your wife is like that. Why are we looking at things that are seen? And all these things disorganize us. They just blow us apart. We can't live anymore. We can't pray anymore. We are ashamed. We can't lead the, um, the fellowship that we ought to lead. Everything that we ought to do because of that little physical thing that they have seen. Why don't you, why are you not happy that the woman is able to follow you to the church and be able to say, look at my wife. Even when they don't ask you, introduce her to them and let them show love unto her. Let her see that, ah, they see me as I am. It means that these people are not looking at all the things I put on my neck, in my ears, everywhere. The believers are not looking at things which are seen. But we're looking at things which are not seen. Oh, we say, God is working on her already. If she could agree to come to the church, God is working a miracle already. And we begin to look at things that we cannot see. Rather than all the time, we concentrate our lives on things we can see. And that's the secret of our victory. That in your life, you'll become free. As free as the air. And you go in the presence of the Lord, you pray, you preach, you minister, you do anything. Because you are not looking at those things. Paul the Apostle said, Therefore will I rather glory in my infirmities. Let us look at Second um, Timothy chapter 4. Let's look at chapter 1 first. And verse 15. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 15. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom is Phygelius and Hermogenes. It says, All that be in Asia turned away from me. You know how lonely you feel when people turn away from you. And it appears that uh, you've lost all your friends. You say, I can understand that the friends in the world, if I lose them, I don't care. But think about it. The children of God. Do you know that when uh, this happened to me, that happened to me, none of the children of God came to visit me? Why oh, are you looking at that? Paul the Apostle said, he could remember, he labored for two years, or one and a half years in Asia, until almost everybody in Asia Minor heard the word of the Lord. But he wrote to Timothy. It was a period of loneliness. Everybody forsook him. He said, do you know, Timothy, this you ought to know. That all they which be in Asia, they turned away from me. Look at Second uh, Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray, God, that he may, it may not be laid to their charge. W what do you think about when you are a little bit sick, nobody came to visit you? 
apart from the sickness, the loneliness, and the fact that none of my brothers, none of my sisters, even thought about coming to visit me. That one is even more terrible than you. You even forget the sickness now. The problem you are now fighting and wrestling with is that all these people forsook me. Nobody asked of me. What if, as you are coming to the church, the policemen delayed you? And he said, uh, whose vehicle is this? Maybe the vehicle was repaired before, but the mechanic changed one of the windscreens. And uh, the number on that windscreen, you didn't notice it before. It was a different number from the vehicle. And the policeman said, how about this? Oh, you said, I don't know about it. What happened is that I gave the vehicle to the mechanic, and uh, I just received it back. They said they have repaired it. But how that windscreen came there, it must be their work. Then they said, well, maybe you are a thief and they locked you up. And if brethren did not see you at the uh, central church, they didn't see you in the district, and nobody came to find out. You are not married, you are a bachelor, they just locked you behind there, and on the third day, they just had mercy on you and they released you. After you came out of that cell, you are in another spiritual cell. You hold on to yourself. You imprison yourself now. Well, they didn't come to me. If I died, that's how they will not come. You begin to exaggerate it. You begin to expand it. If the armed robbers had uh, you know, laid hands on me and they had killed me, that's how those people will not check me off. You see now, we talk about love, we talk about visitation, we talk about everything, and I know. When so-and-so was sick, I know how many times I visited his house. When so-and-so had a difficulty, I know how many times in one day I visited his house. Do you know that all men, they forsook me? Why are you thinking about that? Why we look at things which are not seen? We're looking at things which are not seen. Because if you keep on looking at all those things we can see, they are small, small things, but they will destroy your Christian life. They will take the ministry out of your hand. But to make up your mind tonight, Lord, I don't care what the devil does now. I don't care what any man does. I will not look at the storm. I will not look at the trouble. I will not look at the mountain. By not looking at them, they will get out of your sight. By looking at the invisible, the mighty God, and you stop looking at these things that bother you, you'll be lighter. Your life will be a joyful life. Nothing will bother you. If they do anything to you, since you are not looking at it, you just go your way. They say, what can we do to this man? Nothing ever bothers him. Because he doesn't meditate on them. He doesn't think about them. You can snub him. You can disrespect him. You can insult him, you can push him, you can lie about him, you can even neglect him and forsake him. He's looking at Almighty God. He can see the invisible. That's why the Word of God has told us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Why are you saying, so and so disappointed me, I'm unhappy. You see your Savior, look away from him. So and so did not uh, show me this and did not show me that. What's that to you? Look away from him. Look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We got saved by looking at Jesus. We got into the ministry by looking unto Jesus. If we're going to get to heaven, we will get to heaven by looking unto Jesus. Let's keep on looking unto Jesus. Let's rise up and pray. Our Father, we thank you very much for what you have shared with us. We are grateful that we have come with great expectations in our hearts, believing that you are going to touch our hearts, you are going to touch our soul, you are going to touch our spirit by your word. And Father, we are grateful because you have started to deal with us. Lord, you have called us to life of faith. And Father, we commit ourselves into your hand. All those things that have been a source of discouragement to us in time past. All things that have been causing depressions for us in time past. The persecution that we have been experiencing. The problems in our families that we have been experiencing. The things that are happening to us in our places of work. And all these things have been hindering us from being effective in your hand, from carrying out our ministry successfully, Father, we come to you tonight. And we are praying, dear Lord, that you will raise us, you will help us 
to exercise faith and to look be, beyond the, uh, the, what we see. And Father, we are praying that you will help us so that all these things of the past will no longer discourage us in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we have seen the life of uh, David. He came and saw Goliath, but he did not see what is merely visible. He looked beyond Goliath and he saw the God of Israel that was able to help him to be victorious and he was victorious. Father, we are praying that whatever problems have been in our families, whatever problems we have been experiencing in our lives, so, so much that our Christian life has been going down. The ministry you are committing into our hands is not effective. Father, we are praying that as from tonight, you help us to exercise faith, great faith in Jesus' name. Oh Lord our God, we know that without you we cannot do anything. When Christ walked on, on the sea, Peter saw Christ and he, he wanted to go to Jesus. And when he went to when he, he stepped on water, he was able to walk. But when he saw the, the, the waves, he became depressed and he was thinking. Lord, when we see things around us, when we see the mountains of problems around us, and we are not looked at the mountain mover, we see that we are sinking. The problems are overcoming us. But dear Lord, we have you have renewed our faith tonight. You have called us into new life of faith tonight. And Father, we are praying that as from tonight, Lord, we pray that we will see the mountain mover in our life in Jesus' name. Amen. Also things that have not been, made, uh, been able to make us effective in your hand. Lord, from tonight, we look beyond all those things. Amen. And we will see ourselves victorious and successful in your hands in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, we totally release ourselves unto you. We yield our lives entirely unto you. We ask that you use us to the glory of your holy name in Jesus' name. All those of us who have been persecuted in our, in our homes, either because of our unbelieving wives or unbelieving uh, parents or unbelieving husbands, Father, we pray that all these things from, to, from tonight will no longer be a source of discouragement, a source of despair to us in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you so touch our unbelieving people. And Father, we pray that you, you win them into the kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. We are grateful, Almighty Father, for what you are going to do with us during this uh, retreat period, for the great things that you are going to do for us. We pray that you will transform the ministry of every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. At the end of this program, we pray that none of us will be the same again in Jesus' name. Amen. There are problems in our zones, problems of poverty, and so much that many people whom we have been visiting, who could have uh, wanted to come to the fellowship but could not come because of uh, problems, because of uh, persecution, because of uh, poverty. Father, we are praying that as from tonight, Hours from at the end of this program, when we start to visit them and start to talk word of faith into their ears, we pray, dear Lord, that you will touch their hearts, you will bring them into the fellowship of believers in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we are praying that you will touch every house fellowship, every area, every zone, every district, and every, 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 every each of these places will grow in number, numerically and spiritually, in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, help us so that we will grow in our Christian life in Jesus' name. Amen. All those things that have been weighing us down, that has not, have not been able to make us grow spiritually. Father, we pray that as from tonight, they will, all sorts of things will be under our feet in Jesus' name. Amen. Make us successful and victorious in our Christian life. Amen. 
make a, bit, uh, make a ministry to be successful and, uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father, we thank you because of what you have done. Thank you for what you have shared with us. Thank you for how you have used our pastor to talk to us tonight. We pray, dear Lord, that we will not be the same again in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you for hearing our prayer, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Jesus, O oh